Looks like everyone is ready. And we're here now for the case of State versus Stendrup. Mr. Dickey, you may begin. Madam, <clears throat> Madam Chief Justice, and may it please this court, my name is Gary Dickey from Dickey Campbell and Sahag Law Firm, appearing on behalf of Jeffrey Stendrup. The specific remedy that we ask from this court is the reversal of his convictions for first degree murder as well as first degree robbery. There are several avenues by which this court can grant that relief. With respect to the murder conviction, the district court made several legal errors with respect to its causation analysis and had the district court correctly analyzed the causation doctrine, the evidence is legally sufficient to support the conviction. Additionally, the weight of the evidence is contrary to the district court's conviction for first degree murder. And third, with respect to the first degree robbery conviction, the evidence is legally insufficient. To address the legal errors with respect to the causation analysis, the district court made four key errors. First, in its analysis with either factual or legal cause, the district court applied a standard of direct and foreseeable result, which is not a legal standard recognized in criminal law. The best I could come up with is that the district court had pulled that standard from a child in need of assistance statute and case law. Indeed, the error is so clear that the state does not even attempt to defend the district court's use of that standard uh, in its brief. Second, the district court mistakenly believed that the causation doctrine is different under Iowa law than it is under federal law. And as a result, the district court refused to apply the barrage decision to the facts of this case. And the barrage decision is the leading case involving criminal conduct in which there is a uh, independently sufficient cause of death coupled with an independently insufficient cause of death. Had the district court applied the barrage decision, uh, it could not sustain Mr. Stendrup's conviction because there was not sufficient factual cause. Uh, to that argument, does that, de is that argument contingent on whether or not we allow and consider the medical expert's testimony? Is it Dr. Thompson? Is that correct? Um, and here's what I mean. So the hypotheticals, he does testify that the assault was a but-for cause of death. I mean, he explicitly testifies to that. Well, I, I mean, I, if you rely upon the hearsay within hearsay testimony and you overrule the Tyler rule, I think the remedy would be then to remand to the district court to reconsider the causation issue. This, this is the question to the expert. In this hypothetical, with all of the information, would that person have died or would that person still have been alive but for the assault? You object to it. The district court says, I'm going to take it, subject to the objection, and the doctor says, yes, I believe it would. So isn't that but for causation and doesn't that satisfy barrage? It does not when you look at the, at the, at the clear testimony on cross-examination. Is the methamphetamine intoxication an independently sufficient cause? Yes. Is the assault from the baseball bat a sufficient cause of death? No, it's not. Indeed, his initial opinion was that this was a drug overdose case, and it wasn't until he received the hearsay upon hearsay that his opinion changed. But, but even the change of opinion on those answers on cross-examination under barrage you're confronted with a legally insufficient, independently insufficient cause, which is not a but-for cause. And, and I understand he, he gave an opinion that kind of muddles that all together, but it, it doesn't get any more straightforward. Certainly, if you look at the language of the medical examiners in Barrage, which they concluded, quote, um, that the heroin is not an independently sufficient cause of death because the examiner could not have said that the decedent would have lived had he not taken the heroin. 
That's the language from Barrage. That was what Dr. Thompson's testimony was. He could not say that um, Mr. McDowell would have lived but for the assault with the baseball bat. Conversely, he admitted that 4,900 nanograms per milliliter was more than sufficiently toxic to cause the death. So I, I, I don't think you get there because the district court correctly ruled under Tyler. Taking a factual proposition, which is that this quantity of methamphetamine in somebody's blood system could be sufficient to cause death, necessarily precludes causation for any conduct that wouldn't independently also be sufficient. And maybe that is the argument you're making, that... That's what Raj says. I mean, that's... When you've got... And, and that's not what his testimony was that it could be. I asked him directly, is that sufficiently toxic? And he said yes. Indeed, he testified about certifying methamphetamine overdose as the cause of death for less than 100 uh, nanograms per milliliter. So I, I, I don't think anybody, including the district court, disagreed that that was a, a sufficiently toxic amount. The court did downplay it based on some other unscientific opinions that were directly contrary. The language from Barrage. Okay, we hold blah, blah, blah. If the use of the drug is not an independently sufficient cause of the victim's death, and I understand your point that it's not an independently sufficient cause, a defendant cannot be liable unless such use is a but-for cause. So if it's a but-for cause, you don't need to show independently sufficient cause, correct? I think what that language is holding out the possibility for cases where there are multiple independently insufficient causes that can be aggregated together. Well, so, so there's... I mean, you know, it seems to... My understanding was always kind of you find the victims as they are. If the victim has a drug addiction and is especially vulnerable, as McDowell was in this case, then that's something that the defendant, you know, has to deal with, right? Right. So, so what the language that you quote in Barrage opens up to the possibility where you have multiple people who put one drop of poison and then when you aggregate it together, it, it's lethal. So you've got multiple independently insufficient causes that are aggregated together. Not necessarily so. I mean, what if this, this baseball bat beating is the domino that sort of starts the rest of it going? Even though it wasn't enough, it was sort of but for a cause that then triggered the rest of it. I mean, isn't, isn't that sort of fair to say that that seems to be what the district court found here? Well, no, that's not. So I think you're talking about the scenario like Tyler, which it's the domino effect. This is not a domino effect type case. It wasn't the baseball beating that led Mr. McDowell to take the methamphetamine, which was ultimately the cause of death. Not that, but that the beating sort of starts this adrenaline rush that's exacerbated by the drugs that he's taking, which causes the heart attack that otherwise wouldn't have happened but for the, the baseball bat beating. Well, that, that's contrary to Dr. Thompson's opinion. And, and let, me, let me try to explain it to you this way, which is exactly how Barrage did. So take out the heroin and look to see if the rest was sufficient to cause his death. And, and it was. Both examiners said that. And so they said, well, then, then that's not a but-for cause. Apply the same reasoning. Take out the baseball bat beating and is the rest left there to, sufficient to kill? Absolutely. So then you can't, then the baseball bat, unless you could show it accelerated, unless you could show it accelerated the cause of death, but I specifically asked Dr. Thompson if he could make that opinion, and he said no. So there is a body of case law from this court that says if you can show an acceleration of death, then you might be in business, but that was, that was specifically disclaimed, and there's no other evidence in the record from which to draw that conclusion. What about our older cases, particularly Smith? Um, and I'm forgetting the other one now from the 1960s, uh, where it indicates that this kind of additive element, the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak, are sufficient to establish causation for criminal liability purposes. How do you distinguish those, and are those different than Barrage? 
than Barrage. And, and I raised this point with the district court. So there's three buckets of cases. So there's cases with multiple insufficient causes. There's cases like we have here with one insufficient and one sufficient cause. And then there's a third category of cases in which there's multiple sufficient causes. So when, analyze, when, when, when analyzing the but-for causation, you have to decide which bucket it falls into. So the Smith case, for example, is multiple insufficient causes, right? So the Smith case was an assault combined with coronary disease. And assault on a healthy person would have been insufficient. But when coupled with another insufficient cause of health disease, plus the element of acceleration, then you get to the factual cause, right? And then you have the other bucket in which you have multiple people firing rounds of bullets at the same time, both of which are fatal. The law of causation is massaged to allow both of those to be factual causes. Ours falls right into the third category in which you have the barrage scenario. You have a sufficient cause of methamphetamine intoxication coupled with an independently insufficient cause of the assault. And under that situation, the assault is not a but-for cause. What's difficult about this is we have something going on inside his body that we don't know about, right? It's not that he started being hit with a baseball bat and the chandelier fell. And we know that the bat had nothing to do with that. This is the bat, the, the, the beating, starting his heart racing in all likelihood. You know, there's this kind of skirmish throughout the house. And is it enough for us to sort of say, we are completely confident that the judge was, was wrong in finding that this beating had something to do with, was, was a but-for cause, I guess, as, as he testified, to the actual result that happened here? So let me make two points. First, I disagree with the factual premise that, you, that, that the assault starts the heart racing. That is not what the testimony was. If, if that was the testimony, I think you could infer that it accelerated his death. But Dr. Thompson specifically disclaimed acceleration. What the evidence was is that he had taken methamphetamines earlier in the day, which in and of itself ups the nor f, or f the, um, the, the fight or flight reflex or the adrenaline reflex. And so in order to, to come to a conclusion that the assault increased that, you would have to know two things. One is a baseline of what his adrenaline or fight or flight re reflex was, and then the ability to measure and Dr. Thompson specifically disclaimed the ability to do that from the autopsy. And so just factually, there's nothing in the record from which to infer that there was any incremental or marginal effect on the fight or flight reflex other than pure speculation. So, but to get to the second point, is it all right to say that it's okay to hold him legally responsible? That's not a factual causation analysis. That gets to the proximate cause analysis, which the court also um, made an error in its, in its proximate cause analysis. And at some point, this court has to decide what proximate cause is. I think under the scope of harms analysis, I think it's closer to the chandelier. The reason why we hold people accountable for beating somebody with a baseball bat, I don't think contemplates that it's going to somehow aggravate an already fatal methamphetamine overdose. What about the cases where you have people who have existing kind of potentially fatal heart conditions? I'm sure you've read them, the bank robbery cases and an elderly gentleman passes away and the court says, that's a but for cause. Right. And there, there are tons of those. And, and I guess it strikes me that it would be an odd holding to say that somebody could be liable for the death of a customer in a bank that they never touch, but they can't be liable for murder if they beat somebody with a baseball bat and the person also dies of a heart attack. Justice McDonald, you're, you're conflating two things. You're conflating factual cause, right, with proximate cause. So with respect to this case, it's the lack of factual cause, and, and we'll table proximate cause, but with respect to the, the bank robber case, I agree there is a but-for cause, which it set in motion multiple insufficient causes that led to a fatal event. Now, the question is... The, the thrust of the argument, and maybe we're just circling around this, is in your view, when the evidence is viewed in the light most favorable to the verdict, there is no evidence 
or insufficient evidence that the baseball bat attack in any way contributed to or accelerated the death of McDowell? Accelerated, there is no evidence. It was specifically disclaimed. Contributed, yes, it can, I, I would concede, but that's the wrong standard under barrage. And if you're, if you're going to say there's a different causation standard under barrage and the common law set out in barrage, then there is an Iowa law. And a contributing factor is the law. Um, the, the, there's a possibility barrage is wrong. I mean, every state court case that I've looked at that discusses barrage says that's just not the law. It's not the law of, of, of felony murder. They reject barrage. Scalia cites Iowa as a jurisdiction that supports his causation analysis. And I don't think he got it right. <laughs> I mean, he just didn't get it right. This court is free to adopt a different uh, common law analysis of, of, of uh, causation. I'm not sure how you get there based on the statutory language. And I, I'm, seven justices of the United States Supreme Court thought the common law analysis of causation was corrupt under Barrage. I, I see my time has expired. Thank you. Good afternoon, may it please the court. This case is about a chain of events that resulted in death. And the defendant's conduct was a but-for link in that chain. So he was properly found guilty of first degree murder. Defendant's causation argument has two fundamental flaws, one in how it applies the facts and one in how it applies the law. Um, as to the facts, uh, does not apply the facts in the light most favorable to the verdict. The medical examiner never said that, the, that Mr. McDowell's methamphetamine level was fatal to Mr. McDowell. He said, theoretically, that level could be fatal. But he specifically says, any level of methamphetamine is potentially fatal. And it's impossible to tell just from the numbers that methamphetamine was the cause of Mr. McDowell's death. Um, he referred to peer-reviewed studies that showed higher levels of methamphetamine that were not fatal to the people in those cases, um, and a study that showed fatal levels of pure intoxication range from 1,000 nanograms per milliliter up to 14,000, nearly three times as much as what uh, Mr. McDowell had in his blood. So, this um, on the record that that he also testified that um, passage of time and extensive usage can lead up to tolerance, a higher tolerance. Was that in the record? Dr. Thompson described that. Um, said that is the reason um, why the world of forensic pathology cannot base it on the number alone, because each user has a different tolerance based on their past usage. Um, and in this case, there was strong evidence that Mr. McDowell was a heavy user of methamphetamine. Um, even from Mr. Sundrup's own mouth, he said he's constantly smoking the drug. Um, there's some disagreement um, that Mr. Sundrup has invented about um, whether Mr. McDowell had access to methamphetamine in that last week. Um, but the evidence proved he did, because he's bringing methamphetamine over to give it uh, to Dave Anderson. And in fact, during the autopsy, Dr. Thompson finds a baggie of white crystalline substance in Mr. McDowell's pocket. So that proved that he did have access to methamphetamine going along um, before. No, that's not necessary. Um, and so we have Dr. Thompson's explanation of the additive effect of, of the different inputs um, that are leading to the racing heart, uh, the increased blood pressure, the constriction of the coronary artery. Um, and he says that's the fight or flight response from the baseball bat beating. 
that adds on to the effects of the methamphetamine that impacts a, an already diseased heart to a, a higher extent. Um, so that is all in the record without objection. Um, but then we can take that and apply it to the facts that the district court found credible here. And what we have is Mr. McDowell shows up at the house. Um, he's acting normal. He's acting himself. He's walking. He's talking. He's interacting. There's no signs that he is imminently going to die from methamphetamine at that point. It's not until the defendant comes in the door with a baseball bat and starts hitting him and then uh, leaves him unresponsive on the carpet that uh, Mr. McDowell dies. Um, it's a different case than um, imagine when Stendrup shows up, McDowell is passed out on the couch um, currently experiencing a methamphetamine overdose, and Mr. Sender whacks him a few times. That, it, it's sort of a, I think common sense maybe supports that, but isn't this, it, it's a medical issue ultimately, whether these non-lethal blows could be the but-for cause of, of uh, McDowell's death, uh, you know, g given his condition, I mean, isn't that ultimately a medical issue where you need some kind of expert testimony? You can't just apply your common sense and say, well, because he, he was non-responsive after the, the blows were hit, that proves that the blows caused his death, right? I, I, I think that is a common sense judgment that a reasonable trier of fact could draw. Um, there is no requirement in a murder case to have a medical examiner come in and testify about cause and manner of death. Um, but it's especially repugnant to uh, the truth-finding function of uh, a jury trial or a bench trial to disallow the expert from sharing their medical expertise. I mean, isn't Tyler kind of a different case from this? And in, in Tyler, I mean, and I joined, I wasn't with Tyler, but, but I, I nonetheless think it's a different case. In Tyler, you really had the medical examiner being just kind of, it didn't really add anything in medical terms to the, to the state's case. What the, the medical examiner is just saying, well, you can't, you can't really tell if it's a stillbirth or a drowning, except based on the mom's confession, uh, the defendant's confession. Uh, in this case, you know, there is a medical issue, whether somebody with that amount of meth in their system could be kind of driven over the edge, or in this case probably was driven over the edge by what would normally be non-lethal body blows from a baseball bat. That's a medical issue where normally we would allow medical testimony, right? I agree this case is different than Tyler, and for that reason, the answer should have been um, considered by the district court. Uh, because, you know, that is, as you say, it, it's the heart of the issue here. Um, so that's the point where medical testimony is especially important to the trier of fact to understand, um, you know, the judge or the jury doesn't have the medical training to understand um, the medical consequence of the facts that they find credible. And that's exactly what's going on here is it's not that Dr. Thompson's answer um, is anything like the, the Dudley line of cases or the Meyer case where there's a witness who, who testifies X, Y, Z facts and an expert being asked if X, Y, and Z, does that show that this person was abused? That is vouching for the credibility. Instead, this is, we have somebody testifying to fact A, can you extrapolate for us using your expertise, what is the, the inference B that we can draw from that? Uh, what is in the record? So with respect to the hypothetical questions, those are posed by the prosecutor. Mr. Dickey objects to most, if not all of them. The district court allows them subject to the objection. And then in the verdict, I'm not sure. So are they in evidence? Are we allowed to consider them? The district court seems to indicate kind of 50-50, I'm not sure how to take that. What's your take on that? They are in evidence, they were presented at trial um, and the court never said they were inadmissible. 
the court said, I'm not considering them. And this is consistent with a separate. They went too far, which seems to, at least I infer from that, that they were probably inadmissible. Yeah, I mean, the court wouldn't have said that it wasn't considering them if it thought, unless they, it thought they were admissible, right? Well, I'll point you to the other instance where the court did the same sort of thing in the verdict, um, and that concerned a Miranda waiver and some statements that Mr. Stenderp had made. And the court says, I acknowledge the defense is arguing that those were inadmissible in violation of Miranda, so I'm not considering them. It's really an exercise of judicial restraint um, not saying that they're inadmissible, just saying, I'm not going to consider them. I think just so it, when this goes up on appeal, it's not going to muddy up as much as it would if, if there was a, a, an issue about the admissibility of those or not. That's easier to sort of take on an issue like that, where a judge might say, yeah, I have enough other stuff, but with the medical testimony, it's not as clear that he has enough other stuff to go by without it. So how do we square that? Well, we square it with the fact that the court did find there was enough outside of those hypotheticals to find guilt. Um, Suppose we conclude that you need the hypotheticals in order to have sufficient evidence of guilt. Suppose we maybe don't agree with, or with Mr. Dickey's causation position, but, but we agree in order to get to but for causation, you need the hypotheticals. And the judge said I didn't con said he didn't consider them. I mean, don't we at a minimum have to remand? We can't find the facts ourselves. This is a criminal case, right? Um, the issue there is I would wager that in every criminal trial, um, including most that are before a jury, there's certain evidence that the jury decides they're not going to rely on. And we, the sufficiency of the evidence review is not a mechanism to go through and nitpick, did the jury believe this fact or not believe this fact? Did it apply this um, evidence or did it not apply that evidence? And doing so here really opens the door to um, impeaching verdicts uh, and that's, that doesn't seem to follow to me. I mean, we have a jury verdict and it's binary, right? I mean, it's, there's sufficient evidence or there's not, there's guilt or not guilt. Here we have written findings. We can understand the district court's reasoning. If the district court's findings as expressed by the district court aren't supported by the evidence, I mean, don't we necessarily have to remand? Because the, the relevant question here is, did the state present sufficient evidence? Not did the judge believe every piece of evidence that was admitted or did the judge apply every piece of evidence that was admitted? And I suspect that if the court were to apply a different standard of review, a more favorable standard of review in a bench trial, the next case down the line is going to be a jury trial and the defendant saying, you have to apply that same standard here and we have to know what the jury thought about every piece of evidence so then we can come back and, and impeach that verdict. Um, otherwise, that party who elected to um, enforce their jury right, um, their constitutional right to a jury trial, is going to be treated less favorably. Um, so I'm going to try and make it even harder for you. All right, let's suppose this had been a jury trial, all right? and. Um, Suppose we interpret what the court did as uh, a, a, um, a, a ruling actually excluding the, the uh, evidence, uh, uh, the hypothetical questions. Let's say the, the questions came in and later on the court says, I've, I've thought about it and tells the jury you should disregard those questions and those answers, all right? The jury finds the, uh, the defendant moves for a directed verdict that's denied. The jury finds the defendant guilty. On appeal, there is insufficient evidence. We, we review the record and say there's insufficient evidence without those uh, questions and answers that the trial judge excluded at trial. Don't we have to acquit the defendant? 
under that. No, remand. Yeah. remand on a jury trial, right? Right, which is why the state, in this case, brought this issue up before trial and tried to get a firm ruling on this and, and actually did get a ruling in advance saying hypothetical questions would be allowed. Um, but in that very specific circumstance, I, I think we do have an issue because the court is making its ruling explicitly on the admissibility of the evidence rather than um, this court's ruling, which could be interpreted as admissibility or it could just be interpreted as out of judicial restraint and to remove a potential issue from the appeal, I'm not going to consider those, but not saying it's out of the record that it's something that, that I can't rely on and that I shouldn't rely on. It's just an exercise of caution. Um, in an odd way, the district court was trying to bulletproof the findings and the verdict by saying, I don't even need to rely on this contested evidence. Maybe it's a strategy. It, it seems like it kind of worked in reverse in this case. I mean, th that's your argument, right? That, that when you say restraint, you mean the judge was trying to bulletproof the verdict. Is, um, he thinks that these are a little close to the line, so I, we're just not gonna make that into an appellate issue. I'm, I'm gonna find guilt based on other issues, but um, when it comes down to it, the evidence was admissible and, and should have been admissible under Tyler. Um, so this court um, should not only um, affirm the convictions, but also um, rethink and re-examine the Tyler decision. Thank you. Mr. Dickey. May it please the court. Justice Mansfield, I want to start out by, by talking with you about Tyler because I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where you, what your questions were getting at. In, in this case, the evidence was without Dave Anderson's statements based solely on the science, there, there was no basis to conclude that the assault played a role. It was, the, the finding of Dr. Thomas was that it was a, a methamphetamine overdose. It was only when we had the hearsay within hearsay testimony that was given to the medical examiner through Sheriff Halfordy, through Dave Anderson, that he changed his opinion. And, and even then, it's a classic post hoke ergo propter hoke fallacy. He, he didn't provide a scientific basis for that because when I probed him on how you arrive at the, at the marginal increase, he, he disclaimed the ability to hypothesize the baseline nor epinephrine level and to be able to quantify the marginal nor epinephrine effect, if any, from the assault. In fact, he even walked it backwards. He talked about how methamphetamine users, after a certain period of time, if they're chronic, they have chronically low nor epinephrine levels, which is why they have to use more. So that would seem to actually run contrary to the you know, to, to the opinion that there can be some marginal increase, essentially that he scared him to death with this assault. Contingency of the medical opinion, a counsel in favor of using the hypothetical question. So meaning that in Tyler, the entire opinion was based essentially on non-scientific statements. The defendant's, if I recall, statement about the baby being born or alive or, or dead here, the hypothetical kind of resolves that problem, but when the expert can say, if Mr. McDowell got up and walked around, then my opinion is X, and if he did not get up and walk around immediately after the beating, then my opinion is Y, that seems to me a perfectly reasonable way to deal with the fact that's being disputed, whether or not he, McDowell got up, and linking that to the medical testimony. I don't, I don't disagree with you that properly done a hypothetical question would avoid the bootstrapping credibility problem that was addressed by this court in Tyler. So I agree with that. But, but the problem is, even if we went down that road, which I didn't think the court was letting us, I think that would have opened the door for us to challenge those opinions under um, 5.701, 2 or 3 for the reason I just explained. I mean, there needs to be a factual or a scientific underpinning behind those conclusions other than close in time equals causation. Uh, and, and when I cross-examined Dr. Thompson, he, 
he was not able to explain a baseline of Mr. McDowell's nor epinephrine levels. And you would need to know multiple factors, including tolerance, which he specifically disclaimed the ability to do. Um, you would have to then also know what the additive nor epinephrine level was from the assault, if any, which he was unable to do. So for him to say that the assault somehow scared him to death when he can't provide any underlying factual basis other than the existence of the idea that fight or flight may apply in these types of situations, I think is very problematic. Which We can debate what the, the value of, of the medical testimony that he provided, and, and, and I agree that any fair analysis of the case must review closely the testimony. But in the, in the Tyler case, and I think it was Dr. Thompson in that case too, it, who was involved, in, in that case, he was just, in essence, you know, rehashing what was in the police reports. He was offering no medical value to what was, to what was, uh, whereas here, it's a medical opinion. We can debate whether it's a, it's an admissible, a, a, val, a uh, worthwhile one, whether it's sufficient, whether, you know, whether it establishes but for causation or not. But it is a medical opinion, right? I mean, that's the difference. Well, I'm, not, I'm, not I'm not sure it is, and that gets into the general problem, which I raised with the court, is Dr. Thompson is deciding the cause of death based on five statutory categories, which is different than a forensic conclusion applying the legal concepts. And so it's really hard to tell from Dr. Thompson's opinion, is, is he making a causation opinion with respect to the administrative rule categories for you know, the vital statistics, or is he giving a forensic opinion? And that's why when I drill down, how do you make that determination based on science, he disclaims all the abilities to estimate tolerance and to quantify marginal you know, effect from, from the assault. I see my time's expired. State of Iowa versus Jeff, Jeffrey Stendrup is hereby submitted, and the court will be in recess until tomorrow morning. Thank you. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.